Hello, uh, in this short tutorial, I'm going to walk you through the basic uh, functions of Trans.Earth. Trans.Earth is this tool for analyzing land condition. So you can identify land degradation in the form of these three sub indicators, which are changes in land cover, changes in land productivity, and changes in organic carbon. Sorry, I changed the order there a little bit. Uh, but the idea is that you're going to use, use Trans.Earth, which already comes with pre-populated global data sets on, on land productivity and DVI data sets going all the way back to 1981, then land cover data sets. In this case, we provide a default ESA CCI land cover product that goes um, back to 1992, and it's calculated annually, and then soil organic carbon from soil grid. Um, and we're following uh, a good practice guidance developed by the UNCCD in order to, to assess, use this input data to create these sub-indicators, finally integrate them into what is the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal 15.3.1, which is the proportion of land degraded over total land area. So I'm going to walk you through the main functions of Trans.Earth using these global data sets, but also remember that Trans.Earth has the the option of it allows you to use your local data when you have it available. So the, the, the strength of the tool is that you can run this analysis anywhere in the world using the data already provided there, but then if you have better data, it also allows you to use that data in order to generate improved indicators of, of land degradation. So I'm gonna go straight into QGIS. Remember that, um, Transload Earth runs on QGIS 8, uh, 2.18. It's, it's Las Palmas, that's the version. We're working on the upgrade to version 3, but we don't have it yet. So the first thing you need to do is open QGIS. Once QGIS opens, it's going to load, depends on which projects you had been working on. You have some information here, recent projects, or it could be as a blank white page. Transat Earth is this bar here. So you see these, these icons, uh, the range, the calculator, the tree, all the way to the I. That's the Transat Earth QGIS plugin. How you install it, you can find in our website, Transat Earth, more information, the details on it, but I'm going to walk you very quickly on how to do it. You just go here to plugins in the top, click there, manage uninstall plugins, click there again. You do need to be connected to the internet because you're going to be accessing the repository of plugins. And then in the search window, you just type trans and it's going to show up. Uh, since I have it already installed, it's not going to give me the option to install it. It's going to tell me that I have it there already. But you see here some information on the tool. You click here where it says downgrade. In, in your case, it's going to say install. You click there and the tool is going to be going to show up. I have it here. Once you have it installed, you first need to uh, register. For that, you will click on settings. And here you have step one registration for which you type your email, name, organization, and country. And then you're going to have an email, get, receive an email with your password. Uh, you come, copy it here, paste it, email, and password. You click OK, and then you're going to get a message saying logged into Earth as, and then the user, the email account that you put there. So as you can see, pretty straightforward. Only takes a few minutes to install it. And now you're ready to, to run the calculation. So as you can see, there's many different icons, different functions in our website. Again, you have all this explained. But for now, I want to walk you through the, the general calculations with the default data, so you have an idea of some of the, the main functionalities of the tool. So we click on the calculator, uh, calculate indicators. Here you have the process is divided into two steps. Step one, which is calculated the sub indicators, so changes in land cover, changes in primary productivity, and changes in soil organic carbon. And then the second one is the integration of these three sub indicators into the final SDG and the calculation of the areas. So like I explained before, here you have the option of using the default data, which is option one, or you can use your customized data if you click on each of the options for the data that you have. And you can, of course, run combinations of different. So if you 
you have a land cover data set, but you don't have productivity and soil organic carbon, you can use the default for those two and then your custom data for land cover. Uh, so you can run any combination of these as you want. Again, for now, I'm going to run with default data. I'm going to click calculate all three sub indicators in one step. And here we're going to define the parameters for all the calculations. So the first one, it's the period. And this is key because remember that we're looking here at changes over time. So the time period that we're looking at, it's really going to affect the, the information that the indicator is going to tell us, which areas identify as improving or as decreasing in terms of getting worse in terms of, of degradation will depend on the time period that I'm looking at. In this case, I'm going to select 2001 through 2015. Again, we, we have been working a lot with the UNCCD to support countries on reporting to SDG 15.311 and on the reporting the countries due to the, to the UNCCD, the United Nations Convention to Combat the Certification. So I'm going to leave it as that time period. But if you were interested in looking at a different time period for, I don't know, an area where you know you have a project that started in 2005 or you have a particular intervention that you're interested in looking at, you can change these to, to whichever period you want. Um, in terms of the land productivity indicators, we recommend using the trans.earth option. This is going to calculate three sub indicators again, the sub indicators of productivity, which are changes, changes in trajectory, uh, changes in state, and then perform. And each of these three have, um, have different meanings. It gives you different information in terms of changes in productivity. Trajectory looks at the overall long-term trend in productivity, um, but it's, that trend is not very sensitive to recent changes. So we included state, which allows you to identify recent changes, the improvements or decreases in productivity, uh, which are missed by trajectory. So they complement each other. And then the third one is performance, which gives you a comparison not over time, but over space. So instead of comparing each pixel, how it changed over time, it's going to compare each pixel to similar pixels in the same region. So it's going to identify regions which are performing similar to the average, or are performing below the average or above the average of areas with the same land cover and the same soil type. So it gives you a little bit of contextual information for you to understand what these what this changes mean in terms of, of your region. Um, again, all these details are explained in our website. All the code is open, so you can, you can go to our website and you have narrative descriptions and diagrams of how each of these indicators is computed. Um, and then you also have the code to, to, if you're a little bit more technical and are interested in the actual coding, you can also access it there. Um, so these dates, remember that they apply to the three sub-indicators because we selected the option one step for the three sub-indicators. So this will apply for productivity, for soil organic carbon, and for land cover. For soil organic carbon, the only parameter that you need to select is the time period, so you're good to go. For productivity, the same thing. For land cover, there's a few parameters that we still need to adjust. So click Next, and we're going to move to the land cover setup. And you can see here that it's telling you that it's using the default data, the European Space Agency, CCI land cover product. And this product has 36 land cover classes, but for the analysis that we do, we ag aggregate things into seven land cover classes, because otherwise doing a transition matrix and an interpreting a matrix of 36 by 36 would be very complicated. So uh, the UNCCD provided this guidance uh, on aggregating this this original <clears throat> 36 land cover classes to seven, and this is what we would do here. So, but the option that the tool gives you is to edit that definition. So if for whichever region in reason in your region, um, this definition is not accurate, you the tool gives you the option to change it. So let's say that in your study area, for example, a tree cover, it, a forest is defined as something with more than 40% of tree covered. So here, these classes 50 and 60, which define a tree covered area, a forest, as more than 15% would not be accurate. So if in your country you have different definitions, you could change these to 
I don't know, it could be a grassland or it could be any of the seven uh, options that you have here. Again, this is something not that we encourage people to change, but it, it's important to give them the option uh, for the final product to reflect the conditions of your study area. In this case, I'm gonna restore the default. I'm not gonna change anything. But if you consider that for the, your area, it's important to change it, you can modify it here, save the definition here at the bottom, and then you have it saved for the next, for the next time you run the tool. So you don't have to be changing this manually every time. So here, again, we're changing the way the classes are aggregated. We click next, and then we get to this matrix, which is the key of the land cover sub-indicator. So let me step back a little bit. Remember that we had the three sub-indicators, productivity, land cover, and soil organic carbon. For productivity, the underlying assumption is that increases in primary productivity are a good thing. Um, this could not be the case in every region, but overall, we assume that an ecosystem that produces more, it's in better condition than one that produces less. So for productivity, more biomass is better, less biomass is worse. More biomass is improvement, less biomass is degradation. For soil organic carbon, similar thing. We assume that more soil organic carbon, the more soil organic carbon there is in the soil, the better the the system is functioning, so we consider that improvement. While decreases in soil organic carbon are degradation. Um, there's a threshold there of 10% that needs to be, but in principle, more carbon is good, less carbon is bad. But for land cover, that's not always, it's not so straightforward. We have seven possible land cover classes in each time period, and then we have seven, so seven at the beginning, seven at the end, so we have a matrix of seven by seven possibilities, and it's not so universally agreed into which transitions are good and which transitions are not bad. This is very context specific. So in order to understand this a little bit, each of the rows represent the land cover at the beginning. So if we said 2001 through 2015, this would be the land cover in 2001, while the columns represent the land cover at the end of the period, so in 2015. So each pick cell in this matrix is indicating the value that we assign in terms of degradation or improvement of each of these land cover transitions. So we're saying a pixel that was tree cover at the beginning and remained as tree cover at the end has a value of zero, which means that it's stable. While a pixel that was tree cover at the beginning changed to grassland at the end, so that would be the second column, the second column first row, that's the loss of forest and a replacement for, by grassland. That, following the guidelines from the UNCCD, is by default identified as a degradation transition. But it could be that in some regions, that's not the case. It could be that in South Africa, for example, this could be that woody plant encroachment was reversed. And we went from an area that was invaded by trees to an area where native grasslands were uh, regenerated or recovered. So in this case, we should change that to, sorry, we should change that to an improvement because it's a good thing. So here the tool, how do we do that since you're not seeing my keyboard, we just select the cell and if we type a minus sign, it's gonna become red. If I type zero, it's gonna become stable. And if I click on a plus, it's gonna become improvement. So, here you have the option of looking at this, each of these transitions, really spend some time trying to understand the meaning of each of them. Another example that is usually quite controversial is this change of, from grasslands to croplands in areas where food security is a big concern. And this is a good thing. We want to, pr to produce more food, so we want that to be considered an improvement. But in areas where grassland biodiversity is very important and we don't have concerns in terms of food security, this could be very well considered degradation. So look at this matrix, spend some time analyzing it, and, and make sure that this reflects what you consider degradation in your area. Here again, you have the option of saving the table and then loading a table that you previously saved. Right now, I'm going to reset it to the default so I don't, I don't mess things up for now. But do spend some time here thinking about this matrix and, and seeing how it changed. And then remember that. 
whatever you change here is how your final output, how your final map is going to look uh, when we look at the sub indicators and finally the, the SDG. Okay, so we define what we consider degradation improvement in terms of land cover. Click next. Now we need to say define the area in which we're going to run the calculations for. So by default, we have some national and state boundaries provided by natural earth. This is not officially recognized data. This is data provided by, by an organization. They're not uh, endorsed by CI. It's just a global data set that we provide as a reference in case you do not have any data. Um, but if you're running this analysis at a country scale, you should run your officially recognized boundary, which you can select here. You select the option area from file, you click browse, and then you navigate to where you have your shapefile, KML, GeoJSON, any polygon data set that you have. It doesn't matter the coordinate system. This, as long as you're defined, the tool is going to recognize them. And then you can run the analysis for your areas. If you do not have a, a, a national boundary or you want to run it for one of the ones we provide, you just type here. In this case, I'm going to type Uganda. I will run it at the country scale. If I wanted to run it at the province scale, you just can select here the second level. So again, the same approach as for the other ones. You can use the data we provide by default, but you have the option of using your local. Click next. Here, we're going to give it a name, Uganda Sub Indicators 2001 through 2015. This is a reference for you. The name should be descriptive so you know what you're running, because remember that we're going to submit a task, and then uh, we need to, the task is going to run in Google Earth Engine. It's going to take a few minutes, and then uh, you're going to need to download it. So if you don't give a name that is descriptive and you start running several analysis, it's going to get messy and you're gonna have a hard time identifying what you're looking at. So now we click calculate. You're gonna see that you do need to be connected to the internet. You see this blue bar here saying that the task was submitted to Google Earth Engine. Uh, and now you need to wait for a few minutes. The tasks, depending on the, on the size of the area, it could take between five and 10 minutes to run per country. It's, it's, it's a bit of a wait, but remember that if you had to download the data, pre-process it, process, run the calculations, integrate everything, add the symbology, this could take weeks or months to run. So, so a few minutes is not really that much of a wait. Uh, once the task, you can look at the status of a task here, view Google Earth Engine task is the cloud with the arrow facing down. You, we're gonna use this option to, um, see the status of the task we just submitted, uh, and also to download it. So here we have SDG indicator um, for Uganda. We submitted this task a minute ago and it's still running. Uh, since I, I didn't want to have to wait, I ran the same sub indicators a few minutes ago, and you can see here that the task is started at 17.58 and it finished at 16, uh, 18.04. So it took six minutes to run for Uganda. It's not that long. Once the task is finished, uh, you're going to receive an email, which uh, so you can check your email and you're going to get a notification there, or you can click refresh here and it's going to be updated to finish once it's done. Once it's done, you click finished, and then you click here at the bottom download. You select where you want to download this data. I'm going to save it in this folder called Trends or Earth. You can just add indicators, 2001. 2015, I click save. And again, for this part, remember that you need to be connected to the internet because right now we're downloading the results. So the, run, the analysis, we defined the parameters, submitted the task to Google Earth Engine, and now once the task is finished, it's downloaded. So it's downloading all the geospatial data. These are GOT files with all the information that are gonna be downloaded into your computer and also are gonna be loaded as you can see right now on the map uh, in your screen. So you can start analyzing the different sub indicators. So now we're gonna display the sub indicators. 
Okay, so <clears throat> here you have the results that you downloaded, that I downloaded, and uh, sub indicators for Uganda. As you can see, the way it's downloaded by default, it's a, it's a rectangular raster, so it's a, it's a GOT if it can be downloaded into any GS software. But you don't have much context information here. So what I'm going to do is use one of the other tools that we have here, which is the visualization tool. So we click here, we click add on base map, and it's going to give you a little bit of contextual information. Again, not official data. Uh, please do not be terribly upset if the boundaries do not really match. It's just to give it a little bit of, of context of, uh, for you to understand it better. So we click OK, and it's going to add some boundaries, some names, and, and water bodies for you to understand a little bit better how it looks. So see, I didn't do any magic. I just loaded that layer, you see, overlaid on what we have, so we can interpret it a little bit better. So now we have a map of Uganda. And now you have here all the different sub indicators. So let me turn them all off. So I can walk you quickly through each of them. So the first one that we have is trajectory. So this one is showing areas in green. It's areas that for this time period that we looked at 2001 through 2015 have showed significant increases in primary productivity. Areas in red have shown significant decreases, and areas in yellow have remained stable. So that's the first of the sub indicators. The second one, let me change the order here. The second one is state, which is also looking at changes, but these, these changes are a uh, most more recent ones. So it could be that they match the trends found by trajectory. It could be that in some areas it won't. If there have been recent changes that are not picked up by trajectory, they're going to be a little bit different. Then, the third one is productivity. This one is identifying areas that are performing more or less uh, than the average. Here you can see that using these global data sets for Uganda, we only identify small areas in the Northeast that are performing less, uh, pro producing less than, than similar areas. But again, here changing the time period and the area of analysis uh, is going to identify very different. The uh, other one is land cover. This is the result of the transition matrix that we showed. Before, you have in green areas where you had green cells in the transition matrix, area in red, therefore there was decrease. Let me zoom in a little bit. So for example, you have urbanization happening around Kampala. So those are identified as red. Then you have here in this section, the northeast of the, northwest of the window to the left, uh, some degradation in terms of land cover also. And you have in the north some improvement. And then the final one is soil organic carbon. This is based on, I didn't explain much from on this one, but again, the information is in our website. Here what it's using is it's using land cover and then conversion coefficients. So what does it change from forest to Agriculture means in terms of carbon, and what does it change from uh, grassland to forest means in terms of carbon? So some of these represent increases in carbon, some decreases. That's why you use the original land cover data and the original soil organic carbon to generate this sub indicator. Okay, so now we went through step one, all the sub indicators. Now we, the final step is to calculate the final SDG and to generate the area. So we click, sorry, I did that a little bit too fast. We go back to the calculator again, calculate SDG, the, two, the second step. Uh, all this, if the layers are loaded into the tool, they're going to be recognized. We have the trends of productivity indicators, land cover, sort of carbon. Click next, we give it a name. This will be the Uganda SDG. We need to give it a name to the final map and also to the final table. They could be the same because we have different extensions. Here, again, we define the area. Here, the area is the one that is going to be used for the area calculation. So it's critical that if you have your own one, you click, you select your shape file. And then, just like we did before, we're going to give it a name. 
But in this case, this calculation is run locally. So how long it will take to run will depend on the size of your area, will depend on uh, the computing capacity, capacities of your, of your computer, the processor that you have, the amount of memory, it usually runs pretty fast. So what it's gonna do, it's gonna integrate all these sub indicators into a final SDG raster, and it's gonna calculate the summary table as you can see there when it's processing. And it's gonna generate an Excel file with all the the numbers, the area. So we just need to wait for a few seconds. Again, just to fill the, this time, remember that what we did is we used the tool to calculate the sub indicators, all the ones that you see that are loaded in the map, for activity trajectory, state, performance, then land cover and solar organic carbon. We defined the parameters, submitted the task, this running Google Earth Engine, downloaded the results, so were the maps I was just exploring. And now the step that it's running is the integration of all these sub indicators into the final SDG and the calculation of the area. So once this finished, hopefully we'll say succeeded, which is said, it tells you where we save the output file. When I click OK, it's gonna load two things. It's gonna load a final productivity um, indicator, which is, it gives a little bit more information, the integration of performance trajectory of state. So it's identifying areas increasing, areas stable, stable with stress, early signs of decline and decline. And then if I turn this one off, this is gonna be the final SDG for Uganda, SDG 50.3.1. So this is the integration of all the red areas identified by land cover, but so organic carbon and productivity. If we go now to, if we go now to where I saved that Excel file, and we open it, it will give an error because Excel doesn't like our formatting, but you just say, okay, and the file is gonna open anyways. And this is the output that you're gonna get. So here is what I showed, what I mentioned before, is the Excel file with the final SDG summary. So in the case of Uganda, all this red area in the map represents 49,000 square kilometers, which represent 24.5 the area. This is the final integration, so you have improvement, stable, and, de and degraded lands, and then you have in this, this for the SDG, and then in each of these tabs, you have this aggregated information uh, on productivity, solar organic carbon with estimations of carbon stocks in the soil, changes in land cover, what is meaning in terms of area, and then the final one is the, the actual table that you need for reporting to the USDC. A lot of information, not much time to cover it now, but please do refer to our website. Our website is just the name of the tool. If you just type in your browser, trans.earth, as you can see there, click enter, it's gonna take you to our website, and here you have all the documentation, how what each of these indicators mean here in this section, you can access the code, you can access the bottom step-by-step -step guides with instructions, so, and you also have our contact information there, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you have a very good day.